and welcome to Crush Your Mountain Health. Excellent program we have for you today because I'm so glad that you're here. We have with us an incredible young lady. Okay, let me tell you about Dr. Trina Desai. She is a research scientist and a molecular genetics, genetic microbiologist. She is also the technical director at Autophagy Inflammation and Metabolism a Core Facility for the University of New Mexico. So you know we're talking about a high powered woman right here, but let me tell you a little bit more about her. She's a research professional with 25 years of lab experience, manages the logistics of scientific core facility with $2 million worth of instrumental training, providing consultation and serving 300 plus customers from 60 plus laboratories and faculty groups. She excels at transforming highly technical concepts into easily consumable lessons for trainees from undergraduates to faculty level. And by the way, let me just let you know, she's gonna dumb it down for us, okay? And we, and we need this information. Her knowledge of cellular autophagy and type two diabetes is powerful and I'm honored to have this incredible young woman with us today, Dr. Sharina Desai, welcome to Crush Your Mountain. Thank you, Henry. Thank you so much. Uh, so, you know, um, our mutual friend, Rita, was thrilled to hey. that you're gonna join us here. And um, folks, if you remember, we had Dr. Rita Lewis on and we talked a little bit about massage therapy and things of that nature. But we're gonna talk a little bit more in terms of the cellular level of things. Now, if you remember, we had Dr. Um, Mikolaj Rajic on a couple of weeks ago, and he too discussed the importance of epigenetics and how that, uh, how that uh, helps us in terms of deciding our biological destiny, our health destiny. Uh, let me ask you a quick question. In terms of cellular autophagy, what is it and how is it connected to treating and remitting type two diabetes? Right on. So let's start here. Let's start with talking about metabolism. Metabolism, what is that? We basically on a macro level, on a whole body level, we eat food, which gives us energy and our body trans, um, transforms that food um, into different things so that it has the metabolic energy needed to breathe and grow and just do all the different um, biochemical processes that it takes to keep our bodies healthy. And then from after those processes happen, we have waste like CO2, like water, urine, BMs. Well, that happens on a cellular level too. So kind of the same concept, you take foods right here, A, B, and C, and on a cellular level, um, the cell uses it for energy, makes heat, you know, we're warm blooded animals, but even cold blooded animals do it and breaks down those nutrients, breaks them down and builds them back up into forms that they can use. So how is this related to autophagy? It's because if we just kept growing and had unlimited growth on a cellular level, um, things would be dysregulated, right? We have to grow a little, we have to prune back a little, kind of like a beautiful garden, right? Kind of like really simple. When we are embryos in the womb, we have paddles for hands. We don't have this wonderful separation between our fingers. It's very natural. The skin between there actually gets pruned back, dies back. Same thing happens in our brains. There's neuronal pruning that happens. So there is there are many examples of the body basically having to eat itself, right? Cellular autophagy. And basically that's just detox on a cellular level, right? Uh, proteins that get old or there's something wrong with them or, or deformed or things that build up that are not supposed to build up, they actually get sequestered or get you know grouped together. And eventually, they, um, they blend with this pink thing called a lysosome and it fuses together. And that lysosome has powerful enzymes that are gonna chew up all that waste and then different processes get rid of the waste, right? So there's a lot of examples, what goes in this trash bin? 
So we're talking damaged proteins, organelles, which are the little bits in the cell, um, and even pathogens, so bacteria, viruses. So this is the waste management of the cell. And um, it's really important. It's so important that we got the Nobel Prize in 2016 for really looking at and defining what are the different steps and what does it do. So I just wanna read a little bit, right? This is Dr. Osumi. He won the Nobel Prize in 2016 for physiology and medicine. So basically autophagy, since it's all about recycling the old stuff and trying to make it usable for new stuff, it's a rapid way to provide energy to rebuild cellular components that may have been old or damaged right? It's a response to starvation, right? Because, oh, we're not getting enough nutrients or stress. Let's kind of rebuild and reuse what we have because stress factors can damage cellular organelles and proteins. Um, you can eliminate invading bacteria and viruses, like I said. It happens in development, cell differentiation. Um, and it counteracts even the, uh, the negative consequences of aging. Ooh, that's a big one, right? So you will look younger. Um, it's part of that process, right? We are constantly combating free radicals, damaged proteins, damaged DNA. So autophagy has this big umbrella process. And so how does that kind of relate to, um, to diabetes? Let's talk about that, right? Oh, am I jumping the gun, um, Mr. Gaston? No, no, not at all. But I did want to just sort of jump in there and just uh, yeah. make, make, make an interesting connection. And I love that, as you said, it makes you, it, that autophagy can help you make, you, make you look young, okay? And I will tell you this, friends, check this out, okay? So let's just say you decide to do some intermittent fasting. When you get into that fasting state, your body is going into autophagy. And here's the cool thing about it. One of the reasons why you uh, start to feel a little bit younger, a little bit younger, your body becomes biologically younger, is because your body starts kicking up more um, mitochondria, it starts developing more ATP. And we're okay, I did not say APB, all points bulletin, I said ATP, that is, uh, that is a, uh, adenosine triphosphate, that's the coin of the realm, the actual currency that keeps your body moving is your energy and therefore when you have more of that more mitochondria you actually become physically biologically younger who wouldn't want that now this young lady is going to break it down even further for us how this relates to diabetes even more so please doctor take it away okay so i'm sure you all know given given the wonderful um education that I know you you already have this great background in, but let's talk about insulin resistance, right? So when you have excess food, it gets stored in your fat cells. And the way that happens is you got insulin here, which is like the key that's gonna bind to this orange bit, which is the lock or the insulin receptor. When that binds, it opens up channels that lets the fat cells take in those carbohydrates um, and sugars. I put here a little tiny pink donut, but you can't see it. So eventually, if you've got chronic excess eating going on, those fat cells are just going to get bigger and bigger, but there's a limit to how big they can grow. So at a certain point, when your fat cells are really big, they get stressed out and they need to figure out a way to protect themselves from getting too big because of all of those carbohydrates that are coming in. So it's actually going to change this shape of that lock of that insulin receptor so that regular insulin can't bind to it anymore. So that closes that channel and no more growth, no more carbohydrates coming into the cell. When that happens, if that's when that happens, that's called insulin resistance. And that's, that's a bad thing, right? And so your pancreas right here in pink starts making a lot of insulin. It's working really, really hard. And eventually it's going to fail. It's going to fail because there's other things going on in the background, like including autophagy dysregulation. Um, but there's a way to reverse that, right? And this is what we talked about. This is what you asked. And how do we reverse it? Um, basically, sustained weight loss um, will gradually shrink your fat cells down. And when those cells become more of a normal um, size, eventually that lock or that insulin receptor is gonna go back to its normal form 
going to be able to bind insulin and everything goes back to homeostasis, right? Like normal, like status quo, right? But that, that step from here to here, that could take months, that could take years. And that includes, as we were talking about, you know, lifestyle changes and it's, it's not a quick fix, right? So um, let's see. So one of the questions you asked me was how does autophagy then connect with diabetes, right? And basically there's, there's quite a bit known how it does that because autophagy is happening in all different cell types. So the main organ that makes insulin is your pancreas, specifically beta islet cells, right? And so when you impair autophagy in those cells, that leads to type two diabetes, right? It's important for the organization and function of them, how it produces insulin. Um, <clears throat> it's really important for maintaining the cell mass, the structure and the function. So when you have dysregulated autophagy, you've got really low insulin production, or impaired insulin production, you've got low mass of beta islet cells. Um, and it's kind of thought that when you dysregulate autophagy, it's a big factor in leading to obesity, um, actually. And there's another thing that happens. There's something called HIAPP, which is an amyloid kind of misfolded protein. And when you have that combination of autophagy and that together, it's even worse news for your cells. So the effect that it has on the pancreas is bad enough, but guess what? Guess what? It gets worse, right? You basically have also your insulin target cells. We're talking your liver, your fat cells, your skeletal system. So all this dysregulation is basically affecting your body on a systemic level. Um, and something like, I, I kind of didn't appreciate until recently, Babies, you know how they're all super cute and chunky and how come that's not unhealthy? It's because they're full of brown fat, which is high met metabolism. Adults, we have white fat. And so autophagy actually helps convert white fat to brown fat. And that brown fat is really good for good metabolism, right? So if, oh, I can't hear you, Henry, sorry. Quick question on that note, yeah. on, on, on that subject, okay? If you go to the, the, the health section, uh, the exercise section, you see all these things that say fat burners. And, you know, okay, do people really burn fat when they exercise? Is that what really happens? Burn. So from a strictly biochemical point of view, that's the addition of oxygen to burn. But that just means you are using up, right, those lipid stores. Lipid is the, the storage of of energy in those adipose cells, right? So you wanna use that up through autophagy, right? So autophagy is gonna come there and when you have good autophagy and it's regulated well, those lipid droplets within the adipose cells are gonna get smaller. So we talked about fat cells growing and at a certain point they're really unhappy and that's when things start to look bad from an autophagy level. So. You know, some of those products that they sell at the health food store, they're not FDA approved, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of it's there. And a lot of it's like a little bit of gym wisdom it, and wisdom I'm using loosely, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, I think some so, of that kind of falls under the purview of like um, um, essential oils, which is not bad, right? And also I things, things from Eastern philosophy, like Ayurvedic medicine, essential oils, I think they all have their place, but I think it's all fair game to say, how does it work? Let's study it, let's see what's going on, right? So I'll just leave it at that. And there are some people that do study like branch chain amino acids, right? Are they good? Is protein from animals versus plants better or worse? And I'll get to that actually, I have that and I have the quick and dirty answer, but yeah. Well, yeah, and the reason why I asked that is because you, you said in your, you actually said it very diplomatically in your answer because you refer to the shrinking of fat cells. Fat cells, they get too large, they get unhappy, but now when they shrink down, then they're, then they're happy, then they're good, then we, then we feel good. So, we, so we, I, don't, I really want our people to realize no, you don't have to burn your fat, okay? So, you know, stay out of the oven, so to speak. 
but do what you can to shrink those fat cells because what's happening is they are becoming terribly unhealthy and terribly unhappy. And so to make you happy all the way around, don't worry, be happy, do what you gotta do, that's all. Quick question, well, next question. And just to connect that real quick, right? Yes, like liposuction might get rid of the number of fat cells, but the cells that are remaining there are still in that enlarged state, right? And so those yeah. biochemical systems that we're describing that you wanna to try to avoid or wanna ameliorate are still there even though you've reduced your mass, right? So um, it's it might be a, a feasible jumpstart for some people, but what we're, what we're talking about is fundamental from ground level. How do we look at health? Absolutely, absolutely. So that kind of, you know, kind of uh, grows into the next question. How does our choice of food and feeding time play a part in our glucose management? Because the whole purpose of insulin is to manage the glucose. That's not the whole purpose of it, but that's what it all does, okay? And the insulin resistance is due to that, is, is tied with that. So the question is, again, how does that, our choice of food, and then the feeding time at that, play a role in remitting our, 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 our type two diabetes and managing our glucose. Yeah, so, um, you know, coming from the point of view of dysregulation, autophagy dysregulation, we are trying in that case to kind of induce autophagy. Um, and you can do that sometimes by intermittent fasting. And I'm learning actually a lot of the real nice benefits of intermittent fasting. My um, supervisor, built his entire academic career on autophagy. And he pulled me aside and we had a nice conversation. His name's Dr. Boyo Doretic. Um, you can look him up. He's a really big name in the field. And he pulled me aside and said, autophagy has so many benefits, right? Um, and it wasn't a kind of um, in-depth lecture, but if, if the guy who built his career on autophagy says intermittent fasting is great, I'm just gonna take that at face value um, and do all the research, but basically, um, fasting is starving the cells and that helps to digest some of those cell components, um, to provide the energy for survival. And so autophagy can be triggered by things like deprivation of nutrients, right? That, that short, um, fasting or different growth factors, even hypoxia, right? Which I'm not going to recommend. Um, but, um, things like oxidative stress, or if you have an infection or, physical exercise. So this list that I'm giving you is not all good or all bad, right? Physical exercise gives you that good stress, right? And this intermittent fasting is also a good kind of stress to kind of induce autophagy to happen to get rid of that excess. Because what we're talking about is we've got excess stored up, right? And we want to force the body to use that. Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of asked me like to kind of lean into what are some, oh, actually, on that same note, a very good friend of mine who's a pediatric nutritionist, Dr. Beth Yeeks Jimenez, um, recommended two um, articles for me to read. One is called Dietary Patterns and Management of Type 2 Diabetes, a Systemic Review of Randomized Clinical Trials. So what this paper looked at is looking at all of these published studies about the effectiveness when you go six months or more and they compared low carbohydrate diet, macrobiotic diet, vegan, vegetarian, Mediterranean, intermittent fasting diets, right? And kind of all things together, and you can kind of read the details, is that there's more and more evidence to suggest that vegan, vegetarian, and Mediterranean diet patterns are in general gonna be really useful in controlling your glycemic numbers um, in people with type two diabetes, right? That's not to say it's perfect. Actually, she made a very good point about it's not a one size fits all, right? It's not a one size fits all. And I'll get to that. Like you asked, like what fruits and vegetables are great at reducing glucose? This next article I thought was really good. It's called Nutrition Therapy for Adults with Diabetes or Pre-Diabetes, a Consensus Report. And basically, what it's arguing is that it's really effective and cost-effective both to have a medical nutrition therapist or an IE nutritionist be on your diabetes management team. It's not all about drugs, right? Because as you and I talked about, 
It's some of the stuff that we do as our, in our lifestyle, right? But having a professional there to consider different things um, because people are complicated, right? We've got cult different cultural backgrounds, personal preferences, right? Comorbidities, which are other conditions that you may have going on with your diabetes and also your socioeconomic settings, right? It might not be all possible. And basically her take home message was the thing that seems to work the best is whatever you can continue for the long time, for the long haul. Because you can try something and go really hard for three months. And then if it's just not sustainable, because it doesn't um, coincide with your cultural beliefs or your palate, then we're not talking about a lifetime um, life lifestyle change. We're talking about just the quick and dirty, right? And that's where you get a lot of this roller coastering with diets. And so I would just defer back to, it sounds really simple, but having a nutritionist and seeing a nutritionist, a lot of us who do go see our doctors, I've never seen, I, I've only had one nutritionist in my life. Mm -hmm. And that made a really big difference because she did all the work of figuring out, you know, with my data points, I, I did daily weigh-ins and, and measurements and stuff to see what was working, what was not working. She asked about my energy level, my hydration level. And so um, there are professionals out there. Like we don't have to put all the burden on our own shoulders, just like we would not be expected to know what medications might be, you know, um, not good together. You know, there are pharmacists and, and primary care physicians who have to figure that out. And so the take home message for this report was having a professional who can be sensitive to your cultural background and, and all those other, other things that I talked about is actually probably key to, to getting from pre-diabetic to normal and not going in the other direction or even going from diabetic um, and trying to work that out. So I, I really like that she sent me that because it's, it's really, um, it's not a, a magic, it's not that silver bullet that everyone wants, right? It's, it's the slow and it's together and it's about being there for the long, the long haul. And um, I, I just wanted to throw this up. This is my last kind of um, informative academic slide is what are the diseases related to autophagy? So when we talk about you know, doing in intermittent fasting or something. And I told you that my boss said, oh, it's really good for you. These are all of, these are just some of the many different things that autophagy, when it's dysregulated, like basically there's pretty much no disease out there that doesn't touch on, on autophagy. So you've got neurodegenerative disorders, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, that kind of thing, ocular disorders for the eyes, cardiovascular, right? Your heart and your vessels, pulmonary, hepatic, which is your liver, renal, which is your kidneys, your reproductive organs, your ovaries, your testes, your musculoskeletal systems. So all the red are um, tissue or organ specific problems. And then you've got um, metabolic problems like cancer, right? The cancer is the dysregulation of growth, right? Cells know when they need to stop growing and cancer does not. It just keeps growing. Right. And so immunity to pathogens or autoimmune disorders or the metabolic disorders like ta -da, type two diabetes. So autophagy touches on a lot of things, you know, and, and the short and long of it is if you need help from professionals to help guide your nutrition as being one major part, it's not something um, trivial, right, to work with. It's not just your medication. Some people are really good at swallowing those pills and some people are not, but there's more, um, there's, there's more low tech, there's low tech, right. Um, which is how we eat and our lifestyle and exercise. And it seems kind of, um, passe to say diet and exercise, but I'll tell you this too, because it's autophagy. Um, I have a genetic predisposition to Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's runs in my family. And I asked my good friend who studies tauopathies, right, under which um, Alzheimer's falls under. It's the buildup of misfolded proteins in the brain that causes plaques. Um, and she said, it sounds so cliche, but a low fat diet and mental exercise um, and regular mental exercise and then regular physical exercise 
are the best correlations to kind of reducing your chances of developing Alzheimer's, even with genetic predisposition. So, you know, we're just talking about changing that oil regularly, changing the filters, making sure things work to avoid the bigger problems down the line. Um, and that you don't want to wait till you, um, if you can at all, you don't want to wait till it's, it's so late because there really is no magic bullet um, to do it, right? And the earlier you start, the better, and it's never too late to start. That's sort of my take home message. Well, you know, so much information you've just given us, so full of, full, full, full of, full of stuff that we need to really think about. You know, I'll tell you something, Francis. Many of you know me. If you know there's one thing about me, I'm always speaking to somebody in a different language. That's my mental exercise. And if you know, if, and if you know me, they, you always have to ask me, do you eat that? You know, which more often than not, I do. If it's, well, if it's dead and well bled, I'll eat it. Okay, but there is a way that I do things and a way that I encourage others to do things according to your circumstances, according to what you can do. Most importantly, though, think about all of the things that you can avoid and in some cases even reverse if you just took the action to manage your eating lifestyle. I don't like to say diet, as you know before. I say, you know, the, the reason why I don't like to say diet because it starts with D-I-E. And so you die. I don't want to do that, <laughs> okay? But our eating lifestyle helps us to regulate our bodies to the maximum, okay? There is no limit to the benefits that you can get, okay? And by the way, she mentioned, we talk, we're talking about fasting. Um, all mammals fast because they go into hibernation. And guess what? Every major religion on the planet has fasting as part of the program. Sometimes we do it, especially within the various um, strains of Christendom, the, uh, folks kind of decide to go on a fast or what have you. But what if you did it in a more controlled way that allowed you to have the autophagy that your body needs to get better. What if you did that? Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? Well, here's the thing: we we we, we love that. We love food, and as you and as you know, um, we have a wonderful variety of foods here in the city of Oaks specifically. But seeing that our dear doctor mentioned different types of food, we're going to ask you what. Um, Great, diverse, because you like, Doc. Oh, man. I, if it's on a plate, I want it. <laughs> um, I, I just, I love every version of Asian food from East Asian to South Asian to Middle Eastern to African to Latino. Um, I think we should try it all, right? We should try it all and, and all in balance and all in proportion. I believe that food's an adventure. I believe, believe that food is a way to share culture. It's my love language. That's how I share my love with friends and family as I cook. Um, my garden is dedicated to my child. And so everything that I cook that's from the garden, I feel it's extra blessed and touched. Um, so everything, everything, right? But in terms of health and being health conscious, right? I have definitely made um, strides to lower my cholesterol, for example right? And add more vegetables and whole grains, right? And sometimes I'll make something and it tastes just as good as, you know, and, and I'm lactose intolerant, right? And so I will still have two thirds of a cup of cashew yogurt, right? Which has probiotics, which is good for my GI. Um, and it's not, it doesn't have lactose, you know, and there's also maybe a political statement there about the dairy industry. No, no offense to the dairy industry, but um, you know, with fresh fruit, oh, so. right? And then, and then things like um, whole grains, right? So oatmeal several times a week is good, you know, instead of white bread, white, white bread, whole wheat bread, instead of white rice, couscous, right? And I don't know if you remember, we talked about um, simple sugars versus complex sugars mm -hmm. and how your microbiota in your, in your GI actually can change. They showed it in mice. 
in as little as one meal, right? Just what you give your body. It's that fast to react. And so what happens is there's layers when you, when you think about your intestines and the middle of it, the space is called the lumen, the very bottom, that basal part, right? The bottom is where your cells are, but there's a thick layer of mucus protecting those cells. Well, what happens is there's all layers of bacteria there, right? And we'll call them classes, class A, class B, class C, whatever. When you eat complex carbohydrates, that first class of bacteria, that's their favorite food. So guess what? <clears throat> They'll eat that and their byproducts end up feeding that class B level of microbiota and then class C, right? So the more simplified carbohydrates, they go all the way down to the bottom. And this is a healthy GI system. When we eat simple sugars, what we're doing is we're feeding that very bottom layer. Of, of microbiota and we are disrupting the balance. And actually what happens is when you starve them of say like carbohydrates too much, they'll actually start to eat the mucin layer in your GI. And then so you end up with leaky gut because that mucin layer is supposed to be there, but it in itself is a form of carbohydrate and they, they kind of use that up because there's nothing else for you instead of this complex carbohydrate system that you've got going on. And that's actually how you get perforations in your GI tract. Ah, it's crazy, right? it's crazy. So there's a, there's a real science and biochemistry to, you know, to what we eat. And there's more and more evidence that what we eat um, affects our brain, right? That there are more neurons that are touching our GI tract and just really having this feedback with our brain. And that's not my forte and specialty, but I'll just say that, you know, people are studying these things and, and it's amazing. It's amazing how much we're learning about the balance in our bodies, both within autophagy and our, within our own intracellular biology, and then um, our coexistence with our microbiota. See, here's the thing, okay? Uh, so many people do not realize that, how can I say it? You might as well call human beings, in fact, in fact, all creatures and mammals on this planet, but human beings in particular, we're walking universes. We have, we're not just, you know, like they used to say, okay, here's your cells, and then here's your heart, here's, a, you know, but we have an entire, we have several different systems. She talked about the microbiota, okay, the microbiome system being part of the body. So, there are, and correct me if I'm wrong, there are more microbiota, in other words, little bugs, <laughs> okay, be it bacteria or, 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 or various yeast, et cetera, molds, what have you, living on and in your body than you have cells in your body. We have about I mean, six trillion cells, if my memory serves me correctly. Six trillion cells in the human body, is that correct? Uh, is it a pop quiz? Is it a pop quiz? I don't know. I'll take your word on it. <laughs> okay, but now. <laughs> depends you, on how tall you are. Uh, okay. Depends on how tall you are. Okay, okay, okay. well, I'm pretty sure. So I have about three trillion cells. Okay. Um, but the whole idea is you have, you, you have quadrillions of microbiota on your body and they communicate with your brain they communicate with your heart they 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 actually will stimulate and regulate the hormones in your system and all the best mm -hmm. you have around your brain they didn't right. even think that you had it in the brain they have discovered that you have those things in your brain and what you feed it right. that is what will determine your state of health and well-being now and for years to come. My dear doctor, I've got to, you know, we, we, we've gone through a lot of stuff and you intimated um, your own mountains that have confronted, that you have confronted in the past and yet you are here. So you have come through the other side. Would you care to discuss that or your name? Um, yeah, I, yeah, what would you like to know? Um, you know, just you mentioned it to me, um, and and we were talking a little bit about 
family and loss and things like that, and then some of the and then some of the the the, the, um, the health things, the decisions that you made, and you know that's why you know I I have my people on as examples, not just for entertainment and not just for education, but sure. the examples are crucial because we have to understand that you know we all have that mountain to face. And the idea of crush your mountain is not to, you know, not to just only endure it until we have to be willing and determined to take the actions. And so that's why I thought that your, that your story was, was, would, would, would be inspiration. Yeah. So just to share with others, you know, I'm very, I'm in a very privileged place to be able to have studied these things and work with people who know these things, right? I'm coming from a very humble place. I'm not here to, to tell you what to do with your life, but just that I learned these things. Um, and it started with, you know, I'm an immigrant. I was born overseas in another country. English is not my first language, even though I grew up here, right? And so I went through um, a time where, you know, my accent was a little bit, you know, something I had to, to work on too. Um, immigration stuff was something I had to consider. Um, my parents were divorced and separated, you know, when I was still in my formative years. I had to go live with extended family. Um, you know, part and parcel, some of our family, including my grandma and even ourselves, at different points in time in our lives, you know, we're on government assistance, right? And so when we talk about, you know, healthy food, we mentioned this, right? It's not everybody has the um, ability to go and go to Whole Foods or um, Wegmans or the other places that you mentioned to get organic, you know, organic stuff, right? But there's levels of what you can get. And I know growing up in the neighborhoods I grew up, you know, there was more, um, more teeny drinks, right? With the high fructose corn syrup in that little bottle for 25 cents. And it's it's hard to make choices when certain choices when you're surrounded, right? By by things that would serve you less, right? I get that. I, I get that. Um, you know, I went, I'm a I'm a product of public school education in inner city, Jersey City, New Jersey. Right. And um, I'm Asian and I, I went to an elementary school where there weren't that many, weren't that many of me. Um, and primarily um, it's hard. It's hard to be the minority among minorities. And then I went to Bayonne High School. And again, I was a minority among another, you know, different population. And, and you just kind of, you know, my whole thing was like slow and steady. Just do the work, do the work and work on me kind of thing. Um, and I think that can be applied to all places. I didn't know I wanted to get a PhD um, at the beginning and it took meeting people. It took asking about their, um, their path in life to finally decide to do it. And, and even still, you know, there were questions like, I come from a family that said, why didn't you become a medical doctor? You know, and I knew in my heart, you know, for all the reasons that I didn't have words for then, that it wasn't for me, right? Um, but I got my master's in molecular genetics um, while I was working full time at Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. I've been working in labs since my freshman year of college, you know, and tried to balance at least 20 hours a week in lab while being a full time student, while working to get a little bit of spending cash on the side to just cover my tuition. I get that. I get all of that, right? Um, my, my grandparents and my parents have a beautiful, beautiful story of immigration, of, of, of surviving, of surviving World War II in the Philippines, of surviving poverty, of making the most when you're um, farmers, you know, in a country that doesn't have a lot of socio-political um, power on the world market, right, on, on the world stage. So there's, there's all of that, right? And then I'm short. I am 5'1". I am 5'1". And, and I don't know, I've been blind to, to being ever intimidated by my height. But I know sometimes there's that. And I told you there's ugly duckling status. I couldn't afford clothes that would spare me from getting teased and bullied. I get all that. And then when I finally joined um, my PhD, I had to leave the program because my, I had a, a child my third year and my, my um advisor at the time said I should just stay home and cook barefooted in the kitchen. 
for my child during my PhD. Wow. And then I said, I, you know, he was born a preemie, my child at the time. And by law, I was in California. I started at UCLA. By law, you cannot give birth and come back to work for a certain number of weeks. And I said, well, I want to come back to work because right now my baby's in the NICU, the NICU, and I would like to just work until he gets out of the NICU so I could be at home with him. And it wasn't legal. So I spent an, ex an extended amount of time. And the first week that my baby came home, he needed surgery, right? So when I finally, finally came back to work, my boss said, well, you just came back from vacation. So where's the work that you did? And I'm like, I had a baby. He goes, you should just, you know, he's like, do you want to just quit and get your master's? And I said, I already have a master's. I was summa cum laude in my master's. He said, in what, dance? So there's that, right? There's people, there's the patriarchy, there's the, you know, um, the ivory tower, there's all of that. I get it. And that's why, you know, you mentioned kind of my little like side project is always just supporting graduate students. And there's a special place in my heart for first generation graduate students, for immigrants, for women. There's a special place in my heart and I will do everything in my power to give them that extra tutoring if they need that extra time. But I'm proud to say that everybody that has ever been through the school of Sharina has learned microscopy really, really well, flow cytometry. In fact, one of my proudest students that I ever had, and I'll keep her name um, confidential. She came to me and she said, I just wanna volunteer. I was in a lab studying T cell trafficking in ovarian cancer. That's my other specialty. Right. And um, she said, my grandma died of ovarian cancer and I just want to contribute. I want to learn and I want to work. And she came from a background where her dad beat her for asking if she could go to high school. But her grandma said, no, let my baby go to high school and learn. And the dad said, only if you promise to learn theology. She's like, OK, whatever. So she went to high school. She got perfect grades in high school. Then the time came, everybody was going to college. He said, dad, can I go to college? He beat her again. Mm -hmm. And the grandma said, mm -mm, let my baby go to college again, only if she takes theology. She said, whatever, as long as I go to college. So she went to college and by candlelight, she would study medical textbooks and all the books of her friends when this person who beat her, her dad was sleeping. And when the time came and she finished her major in theology, her grandma snuck her out and she took the, the country's entrance exam for medical school and she got into three medical schools. But circumstances had it. She moved away from that situation. She learned English. She took like several courses at night and she came to my lab and I taught her everything, everything I could possibly teach her in the time that she gave me. By the time she finished, she, she, she wrote me and said she's got a master's now. She's got a second baby. She's looking for a career as a um, medical technician in industry. And my heart couldn't be prouder. My heart could not be prouder. And there's people out there in the world, right, that just need that extra support or somebody to see them. And um, I'm lucky. It's not everybody. And it's not a pull yourself up by the bootstraps thing because some people don't got the boots. Some people don't got the boots. And it's, it's an alignment of the stars, and um, like having that network of people. And even if it's, even if your family is your chosen family, it's, it's what you got to do. And, you know, I, I mentioned to you, I have three beautiful children. I have two on earth and one in heaven. And surviving the loss of that second one was hard, was hard. So I'm coming at you with humility. You know, all these things, I'm, don't, I'm, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not a replacement for you to go talk to your primary care physician. I'm not a replacement to, to not see a nutritionist. But I'm here to say that I learned a little something. I want to share it with you. If I don't know it, I tell all my students, I'll go find out or find somebody that knows. And I just share that. That's it. Wow. That just blew my mind. And I know it blew the mind of so many others out there. But you know something? It speaks to the superwoman that you are. And, and that is the incredible thing about it. Speaking of which, I see you've got a couple, you have a few superheroes next to you in that picture. Could you tell us a little bit about your superheroes? And then we're going to talk about some of your secret superpowers right, at, right after that. Yeah, so this, this wonderful 
my rock and like the whole reason why I decided to do a PhD was is my husband, Shiv Desai. He's a professor at UNM um, in the School of Ed. And I could not be prouder. His, um, he doesn't study my kind of science. He's a social scientist. And I got to tell you how cool this guy's PhD dissertation was. He took spoken word poetry and used it as a tool to, um, to uplift literacy in the inner city in Los Angeles, like um, uh, charter schools like in, um, and public schools like in Watts, um, and really just to elevate um, literacy and kind of acknowledge the, um, the inherent value in um, the different cultures and languages that he was seeing in the classrooms there. And I think it's beautiful. That's Dr. Shiv Desai. This is my future humanitarian. He's uh, my son, Sudhir. He's a sophomore in high school. Um, he's got the biggest heart. He, he actually gave the eulogy for his brother when he was just five years old, right there, right at the, uh, right at the funeral. But he's all about social justice and working for the community. And he is a servant. He's a servant through and through um, in the community. And this is my miracle um, rainbow warrior. This is Sampagita or Sasa. She was born at two pounds. Mm. Um, and she was really, she just, she fought for her life and she's here and she's tall and beautiful and strong and she made it. Um, and she's like my biggest life lesson, I think. And we say it all the time. I got a PhD just to understand this girl. <laughs> and understand everything that was going on. And I was there by her side, questioning the doctors and telling them, oh, you know, she doesn't need another round of antibiotics. She's a febrile with a lower white cell count. And I was right there, like just representing to be her advocate. So yeah, this is, this is the team right here. And of course, my extended family, my mother, my father, my sister, my brothers, all of them. That's, that's so special, you know. So it, it, it's... This is the beauty of having that background, that foundation, that support that puts you through. But tell us, what is this thing about Latin dancing? Seeing that, you know, I, 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 you have enough right there with that, with that beautiful family and that you to, to, to do any sort of thing. But let's talk about some Latin dancing I, I, I'm frozen again. Let's see if I can get unfrozen. I was so excited, I just froze in place. <laughs> Talk to us about Latin dancing. Every, you know, I think everybody's got to have a hobby, and I, I found mine. I found my passion um, before I did dance. Um, like, I grew up with a whole bunch of uh, Trinidadian, Guyanese friends, Caribbean friends, and we did soca and reggae in our backyard parties all throughout my childhood. Um, college came around and I found Latin dancing. I found salsa, merengue, bachata, recently zouk. And um, no matter what city that I lived in, these are some of my good friends here in Albuquerque. This is a class where we studied zouk and I, I did Polynesian. Um, I was in a Polynesian dance company for a little while. So I shared my costumes and some basics. We learned Afro-Cuban um, stuff when teachers are around. Um, teaching us about orishas um, and it's really been eye-opening to kind of just taste other cultures through through movement um, this is showing you how high we jump and then this are um, some of my dearest friends from Cincinnati Southside is dance company and you know you meet other people like a lot of these folks are from swing and other parts and we went and had a beautiful dance lesson in a in a lava tube in a in a uh, in a, yeah, in an, an, an extinct volcano here in the Badlands in New Mexico. So um, dancing, I'm a real social, I'm an extrovert, and it's been a great outlet for both cultural learning, um, getting to meet people and physical exercise. And then on top of that, you're a black belt. <laughs> I think my black belt done expired. It expired, so... Let's see, my son's 15. Black belt I got, Oh, Ishinru Karate. Ishinru Karate. And so that was my very first taste of, of really feeling what physical discipline felt like, right? And I thought it was a great way to set the stage for academic discipline, self-discipline, you know, that, that little bit of pain in the beginning when you're doing those knuckle push-ups on the floor or, you know, throwing a 
throwing a punch that just that lands in a place that that hurts. Um, I'm not saying everybody should go out and get punched, but just feeling the feeling the pride that you get from knowing that you worked really hard at something. It's a beautiful thing. And I always love my karate family, too. Last week, friends, we talked about walking through fire, breaking arrows with our neck and breaking boards. This lady is taking us to the level of doing a dance and then breaking boards. You know, we're doing something uh, some karate. Somewhere in this universe, there's a video of me breaking a cinder block that they lit on fire, but nobody believes me because this video is lost. I don't believe me, but I guess I was there. <laughs> wow. Now, I, I wish we could talk a little bit about that story because that's amazing. Dr. Sharina Palencia Desai, I really thank you for being here. There's one question that I ask all of our guests in, in, in you know, and this is what I definitely have to ask you because you've accomplished so much you know, I have to say salamat, which is thank you in Tagalog. And oh, by the way, before I get in, I got one more question before the question. One more question before the question. Okay. okay. So we know you spoke, you spoke Tagalog, you speak Tagalog. What, what is the, your village language? So actually, so my mom's side is Tagalog. My dad's side is from Iloilo. So they speak Ilongo, but I grew up with my mom's side. Um, yeah, so it's it's pretty much Tagalog, although genetically I'm Visayan for the most part. And then I've dedicated a lifetime to learning Spanish. And actually, my Spanish skills are stronger than my Tagalog skills. Muy bien. Aprendí español muchos años pasado como niño en Nueva York. Entonces, es muy bien, es excelente. Pero uh, español es mi lenguaje segundo, primero, inglés. Es no, tercero, porque um, primero, inglés. Segundo, francés. Tercera, es uh, español. Right now, bueno. Es right? increíble que, que eres tan listo y tan inteligente. Y muchas gracias para todo lo que tú haces para la comunidad. <laughs> you know, make me blush. Let me stop. So, this is my last question. After teaching us so deeply about autophagy and its importance, after after discussing the the, 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 the the beautiful story of your own development and challenges and that of your students, after giving us all this beautiful extrovertedness you have about you, I have to ask you this question. Sharina Palencia Desai, what does it mean to you to crush your mountain? Uh, a little bit every day. A little bit every day. You don't have to take big steps, and you got to be kind to yourself and kind to others because we can't do it alone. We just can't, right? We got to help others crush their mountain. We got to support each other, and we got to tell ourselves daily. It just, it'll be, it'll happen. Just take a little bit every day, right? I think that's that's it. Wow. Well, that's so important. I mean, that makes total sense. You know, we get a different answer from each individual that we talk to here on Crush Your Mountain. And because everyone has a perspective. But that is so profound because that's how you get through. That's how you create your tunnel. Even if you have to use a teaspoon and just show it bit by bit, it might take you a while, but you're going to get to the other side. And, and I just want to say before we end all this, you know, I didn't mention, I am so lucky to have an amazing extended family. I am so blessed. You know, some of them live in the Philippines. The majority of them live in New Jersey. My in-laws have been all, you know, always supportive and they're all over the country. And it matters. It matters. You know, we build a village, right? And sometimes we can't control who who we're related to, and sometimes we create families, you know, wherever we go, I've lived in different places, and all of that, all of that, we just got to be thankful, be forgiving, and I work on that, it's not, you know, it's not easy, and it's not perfect, but um, Rita is definitely some family from New York, and and I consider you too now, so um, I really want to give thanks, I'm actually on a plane tonight to JFK to go celebrate a wedding of my nephews, so I hope to see them all soon. What part of New York? 
So New Jersey, New Jersey. Oh, yeah, my okay. family's okay. Okay. New Jersey. No, you said JFK. That's home, baby. Right, right. I'm saying, I'm saying. And my sister just moved to Astoria. And so I used to live in Astoria. So it's all love. It's all love. But I really want to just give a shout out to my family is incredible. My family is incredible. And they are the reason. Right. I, I think there's I stand on the shoulders of giants. Right. It's my family. Absolutely. Well, friends, I want to tell you, um, that's so vibe. And many of her family, many of her friends are going to be viewing this in our Facebook live chat or in the Facebook live group in just a few moments. So we look forward to having you there and welcome, 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 welcome. Again, once again, I got to tell you, in terms of your own health, in terms of creating the autophagy that you need, in terms of making your life extended and for the better. Take the time. Investigate what your health needs. The doctor is your teammate, not your boss. To always say that. And do that. The more you do that, you yourselves can feel better and take care of the others and support others. Build the community of health. Now, granted, some areas you have food deserts and it's tough. Then we gotta make the plans. We have to make the plan and when you get together, maybe you can do community gardens or what have you. But you can make something, you can make a change. If you have a Walmart in your area, Walmart actually sells organic food and I was shocked. But that's an opportunity. Take your time. So, as I always say, and again, Dr. Sharina, I've got to say again, Salama, Salama which means thank you. Um, thank you so very much for being here. It's been an amazing conversation. I'm all a buzz. You know, I think I, I think even my microbiota is just jumping up and down conversation. But I want to tell you, friends, again, don't just climb it. Crush it. And we'll see you next time. Yeah. See you next week.